Now, what an incredible song. You know, the only way that we can have hope in all situations is if we take him at his word. You know, as you and I mark Labor Day as the end of summer, that's the way many people see it. Anyone here had a good summer? Good summer. Anyone here had a great summer? It's just been awesome. Well, there are those that have had challenging summers. I mean, when you think about the fires that have happened in Maui, wiping out many of those homes, very challenging time, going through some storms, wouldn't you say? They're going through some storms. Only Jesus can be the hope in that, right? Or even the floods this week that happened in Florida and some other states as that Category 4 hurricane hit land on Wednesday. And Ron DeSantis, he had the, the governor of Florida, he had been uh, giving warnings to residents while that storm was brewing out in the Gulf of Mexico. In fact, it was a tropical storm, and Wednesday morning as I was writing the message, I was listening to the news reports, and by 5.30 a.m., he had already marked that tropical storm as now a Category 4 hurricane. And in the news, here was what Ron DeSantis said. He said, the hurricane will make landfall within the next two hours in and around Taylor County in the Big Bend region of Florida. He went on to say this, do not go outside in the midst of the storm. If it is calm where you are, it may be because you are in the eye of the storm. And those conditions will change very, very quickly. So wherever you are, hunker down and don't take anything for granted here. This is a very, very powerful storm. I mean, he was giving warning to people. The storm is coming. And something that Ron DeSantis knows and the residents of Florida is that in a moment's notice, a storm that is coming and going to hit landfall can strengthen. Have we seen this before? It may be a tropical storm now, but it can strengthen very quickly. And so the residents there know that if they live there, it's especially along the coast, it is a real possibility at some point they may be hit by a sudden and severe storm. Well, that's exactly the point that Jesus makes to us today. As we conclude this summer series, A Sermon on the Mount, in this, uh, or excuse me, a summer with Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 7. We're going to pick up right where we left off. And what Jesus wants us to understand is that there are going to be storms in life, and sometimes they are going to be sudden, and sometimes they are going to be severe. And so look at what he says in verse 24 of Matthew chapter 7. Therefore... Now let's just stop right there because that word tells us that we should pay attention. In fact, we should look at all that's happened before we get to verse 24. Therefore, that small word simply means as a result of. And we would want to ask, as a result of what? Well, if you go back to chapter 5, starting in verse 1, join me there. Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and he sat down. His disciples came to him and he what? He began to teach them. This is where the Sermon on the Mount begins. The crowd is around him. They're listening. The disciples come up and they want to know what Jesus has to say. Well, all throughout the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus has been teaching us all summer long. Isn't it great to sit under the teaching of Jesus, church family? And this series has been incredible. I've learned so much as I've studied and as I've shared the word. I hope that this has had an impact on you. And as we conclude, therefore, as a result of all that Jesus has shared with us all summer long, he's going to conclude his message when you think about his conclusion, it has urgency in mind. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rains came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the what? On the rock. On Jesus Christ, 
and the word. A wise builder will build on a firm foundation. Wouldn't you agree? In Jesus, we have to remember that he was a carpenter. In Mark chapter 6, verse 3, it says that Jesus was a carpenter. In Matthew chapter 13, verse 55, Jesus was referred to as the carpenter's son. So in Mark 6, 3, and in Matthew 13, 55, what we learn is that Jesus learned the trade of his father. It was very common that a Jewish boy would go off to primary education. Then if he didn't go to secondary education, he would learn the trade of his father. And Jesus was a great carpenter, wasn't he? He knew that in order to build on a firm foundation in that area around the Sea of Galilee, he knew what the storms were like. And he uses this as a backdrop to teach a parable, an earthly story with spiritual meaning. Because the storms would pop up suddenly and could be severe right there off of the Sea of Galilee. The area right there was, uh, Sea of Galilee was 700 feet below sea level. And so when you think about how deep that is, at its widest point, it was nearly 8 miles wide and more than 12 miles long from north to south. The sea plunged about 200 feet in depth in some areas, and the hills of Galilee were 1,400 feet in elevation, 1,400 feet above sea level. And the Gulan Heights, those mountains, they reached up to 2,500 feet above sea level. The sea's location made it perfect for sudden storms because those eastern winds would come up over the mountain, especially if they were cold. That cold wind would come down on that warm water over the sea, and it would, because it was heavier, would force that warm air up, and it would cause very turbulent storms. And notice that Jesus didn't say, if the storms come, he teaches when. Every one of us are going to face storms in this life, aren't we? In fact, maybe you're in a storm now. Maybe your storm is physical. Maybe it's that you're dealing with some type of an illness, some sort of a diagnosis that you weren't expecting. We have so many people here that are battling different things, including several people who are battling cancer. Maybe your storm right now is some sort of an illness. Maybe for you, your storm is some sort of brokenness in the family. It could be that the marriage is under attack and you're just barely holding on. Or that you have uh, division with your children. And you want to reconcile those relationships. Maybe your storm is with the habits, the addictions that you might have. Maybe you're facing an addiction to alcohol or drugs or pornography. Maybe that's your storm and you're trying to overcome that because you can see the damage that it's doing. Maybe your storm is because of where you are spiritually, that you haven't made Jesus the foundation of your life. We all go through storms, don't we? And the greatest storm that Jesus is speaking of here has nothing to do with all the storms I just mentioned. We have to understand that when Jesus is teaching about the two foundations and the two houses, he's talking about when he comes again. The greatest storm that we are going to face is judgment, isn't it? And when Jesus comes to judge again, believe me, our foundation is going to be revealed. Is it firm or is it faulty? Jesus says that the one who builds their house on the rock is like the wise man. They are wise. This word wise in the Greek, the word's going to come up on the screen for you, phronomos. It means an inward perspective regulating an outward behavior. And the root of the English, it's the root of the English term diaphragm, which controls key body functions from the inside out. You just think about this word for just a moment, wise. An inward perspective that regulates an outward behavior. In other words, Jesus isn't so much worried about what we say, he's worried about what we do. 
That's why James, the brother of Jesus, in James 1.22 says this. Do not merely listen to the word and deceive yourselves. Do what it says. There are so many people that claim to follow Jesus. Jesus dealt with this last week when we were in the Sermon on the Mount and the verses just before. Look with me in verse 22. Jesus said, many will say to me on that day. What day? The day of judgment. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. There are going to be plenty of people who say, Lord, Lord, did you catch that? That emphatic there. Man, Lord, we were like this, you remember? Remember, Lord, I I know you. I know you so well. I mean, I thought about you sometimes, and sometimes I prayed to you, and sometimes I talked about, I mean, we were like this, Lord. And Jesus is going to say, I never knew you. We didn't really have a relationship. You talked an awful lot about me, but there's no evidence that you truly followed me. Listen, there is such a thing as counterfeit faith, church family. There is such a thing as a counterfeit faith. Like the Pharisees and the Sadducees, from the outward, we can look the part, but inwardly, we can be rejecting and ignoring Jesus. And ignoring Jesus is just as dangerous as outright denying him. And Jesus wants us to build on a firm foundation. And the rock is Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of the word. That's why John 1, 1 says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Only Jesus could fulfill the promises and the prophecies that you and I read. And only Jesus will fill the promises and prophecies that are left to be fulfilled at his second coming. Look what he says in verse 26. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. Jesus knew that if you were going to build a house that would stand the storms around the Sea of Galilee, that you would have to dig 10 feet deep to hit bedrock before you could pour that foundation, those footers, And then and only then could you build a house that could stand the storms around that region. And so it's this parable with extreme language that's supposed to get their attention in the first century and it's meant to get our attention today in the 21st century. How many of us would build our house on sand? How many of us? We would think that's ridiculous, wouldn't we? And that's exactly the point that Jesus is trying to make here. Is that we build our lives on one foundation or another. One is firm and one is faulty. And what we do proves whether we truly follow him or not. Look with me as we finish The Sermon on the Mount in verses 28 and 29. When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching because he taught as one who had authority and not as their teachers of the law. Who was Jesus speaking against over and over again in the Sermon on the Mount? The Pharisees and the teachers of the law. From the outward, they looked apart. They were all about the religious laws. They were all about the regulations. But they lacked a true abiding relationship with God. God wants to be in relationship with every one of us. And when we pursue a relationship with God and we build our life on the firm foundation of Jesus Christ and his word, that is a secure That is a stable foundation, isn't it? Isn't it, church family? And as he concludes this Sermon on the Mount, that's what he wants us to understand. And so he gives instructions on how to build our lives on a firm foundation. 
Here they are. This is your takeaway on your bulletin, by the way. This is your application. Instructions for building our lives on a firm foundation. Number one, acknowledge that God is the architect. You see, people were amazed at his teaching. Why? Because he taught with one who had authority. Other rabbis of their day would, well, of his day, would learn from other teachers. And they taught the things of God. But Jesus, who did he learn from? Who did Jesus learn from? He received it from God, his Father. That's why he spoke with one who had authority, because he did. It was his word. And they were amazed. Imagine the crowd that was there. There were all kinds of different people. People who were believing what Jesus said. People who were rejecting. Now, I would just have us think about who we are in the crowd today. As we hear this conclusion of his Sermon on the Mount, who are we in the crowd? Are we listening to Jesus and what he has shared with us throughout the Sermon on the Mount? Are we urgent about our faith? Or are we ignoring Jesus? Will we walk away today still refusing to have a relationship with Jesus Christ, the only one who can put our life on a firm foundation? The only way we're going to withstand the storms of this life and judgment is if Jesus is our firm foundation. And we have to acknowledge that God is the architect. He is the one who made us, each and every one of us in the room, he made, whether you accept that or not, whether you believe it, it is the absolute truth. He made you and he made me. And he didn't make a mistake. And so recognizing him as the architect is so essential, especially in this day and age where we think that we can redesign ourselves, that we can make a decision of what sex we are. Man, I can't change my sex any more than I can change my color. Why are we being so ridiculous in the world? God made us. He is the architect. He designed us. And King David, he knew that. In uh, Psalm 139, verse 14, listen to what King David said. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. David knew that he was fearfully and wonderfully made by God. God designed him. Friend, maybe you need to hear today that God designed you. He made you. And you're made in his image and in his likeness. He is the only way that you can find purpose and your God-given meaning and value is if you turn to him to find your purpose because he designed you, he made you. And he loves you. Aren't you grateful to have a God who loves you? He hasn't abandoned you. He loves you. God is our maker. Here's number two. Admit our need for God's supervision. We have to admit our need for God's supervision. For years, I had it all wrong. I was on the wrong road. I said last week, I was on that wide road that leads to destruction. If you talk to people who knew me then when I was walking without Jesus, they will tell you how destructive that path was. I not only hurt myself, but I was hurting so many other people. And I'll never forget the first time I heard Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Man, we've all blown it, haven't we? We've all disobeyed God, haven't we? All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We're all in need of his grace and forgiveness. Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord Aren't we grateful for the second part of that verse? For the wages of sin is death because of my disobedience, my arrogance, my pride toward God. Because of that, the wages of sin is death. God, give me what I deserve. Be careful what we ask for, right? Because what I deserve is eternal separation from God for eternity. And the worst part of being separated from God in hell is that God is never there and that is final. And who makes that decision? You know, people often say, man, if God is a loving God, why would he send me to hell? Wait a minute, friend, who chooses? Because God has given us life and death. And he says, choose life. We have a choice to make. 
We have to acknowledge that God is the architect and we have to admit our need for his supervision. And if Christ didn't step into our situation, then there would be no hope. In fact, here's what Psalm 127 proclaims. Listen to this truth. Unless the Lord builds the house, the builder labors in vain. And unless the Lord watches over the city, the guards stand watch in vain. An architect doesn't just design something. They also supervise not only its construction, but they supervise its use. And God should be the authority in our life. He should have the supervision, and boy, don't we need it. Without God's guidance in my life, I would still be lost. Anyone else? Is that your story? I'd still be lost. I'm so grateful for what Christ has done. And that brings me to number three. Accept Jesus as the cornerstone of our faith. You want an instruction on how to build your life on a firm foundation? Accept Jesus as the cornerstone of your faith. Christianity is the only religion that truly leads to a relationship with God. That's final. Jesus said it himself. And it's exactly why he died for us. In Acts chapter 4, verses 11 and 12, Peter, when he's speaking to the Jews who denied Jesus, rejected him as the Messiah, had him crucified, here's what Peter says. Jesus is the stone you builders rejected, which has become the cornerstone. Salvation is found in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. Now last week when I heard Tony was going to be baptized, Dallas had called me and he said, you know, I walked my uncle through the process of salvation after church. He wanted to know more about the Lord. Wasn't that encouraging to see his family come forward and watch him surrender his life to the Lord? And when Dallas called me last week, Here's a young man who just keeps reaching for family and reaching for friends. And he's leading them to the cornerstone. If you're in construction, you understand that cornerstone where two walls are brought together. And that cornerstone that is at the base, it locks those two walls together on the foundation. It's called the foundation stone. And without that stone being there, there's no stability. There's no security. Who is our stability in life? Who is our security? His name is Jesus. Without him, there's no firm foundation. And we have to accept him as the cornerstone of our faith. There's no other name under heaven in which we can ask for forgiveness and be saved. Friend, have you surrendered your life to Jesus Christ? as Lord, the master of your life. And here's number four. Apply God's blueprint to every area of life. We have to apply God's blueprint to every area of our life. When someone designs something, when they oversee and supervise it being made, there is a blueprint. And guess what? We have a blueprint for this life. And it's the Bible. Today, as we get into the Word of God, as we are in the Word corporately like we are every week together, is this your first meal of the week? Is this the first meal that you've had over the last seven days? If so, then you are starving to death spiritually. You and I can't just be in public worship together as we... Uh, come together corporately and we learn from the word together. This is important, isn't it, church family? But we have to be in it privately too. And we need the bread of life. We need the word of God in order to teach us and train us how to live a life that brings God honor and glory. Maybe you're new to all this and you're, you've got more questions than answers. That's why right now is such a great time to sign up for life groups. There are still sign-up sheets in the foyer as you go out and you turn to the left. There's a whole table full of sheets there. You can find out what night it meets. You can find out who the leaders are. And you could join a study. And if you don't have it figured out, if you've got more questions and answers, life groups are a great place to start growing in the word of God together in a smaller 
tight-knit group of believers. Raise your hand if you're in a life group. Are life groups a game changer when it comes to studying together? Praying together? You've got that family that walks with you and they help take care of you in times of need. They step up and they walk with you through difficult times. Life groups are a great place to begin to study and to learn the blueprint for life. Join a life group. Get involved. Maybe you know the name Edward Moat. Edward Moat was born on January 24, uh, 20, 21st of 1797. At the age of 18, Edward Moat, who was born in London, England, by the way, became a very skilled cabinet maker. He was so gifted, he went on to start his own business. At the age of 18, though, he made the greatest decision he could ever make. He surrendered his life to Christ, being baptized into the faith. And he continued in his cabinet-making business. He did very well. But he continued to study. And he had pastors and other Christians who stepped up beside him and taught him. And by the age of 55, Edward Moat was ordained into the ministry. And he began preaching the gospel. And he continued in that cabinet-making business. And he later wrote a song that is one of the most powerful, most influential songs in Christianity. In fact, here are his own words from an interview from 1852 from the Gospel Herald. He said, one morning as I went to labor, it came into my mind to write a hymn on the gracious experience of a Christian. As I went up Holborn, I had the chorus, on Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. Well, he was so wise to write that chorus down because if you're like me or if he was like me, he would have forgotten that great statement. Instead, he did write it down. He put that in his pocket and he went throughout his day. And later that day, he pulled that chorus back out and he added the first four verses of that famous song, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus Christ. Excuse me. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust. Lean, excuse me. I'm going to get this right. How about if I start over so I don't ruin his song? My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and Righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. There you go. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. You know, as we come to the end of this sermon series, isn't that exactly what Jesus is teaching us in the Sermon on the Mount? Listen, if your life is built on anything else, but Jesus Christ. The storms of this life are going to come and your house is going to come down with a great crash. The worship team, they're going to come out and they're going to sing a song, Firm Foundations. And in that song, Firm Foundations, it is very similar to Edward Moat's song. In fact, listen to the first verse of that song. Christ is my firm foundation, the rock on which I stand. Friend, if you can proclaim that today, you stand on a firm foundation. But if you cannot, it is faulty. And at some point, it is all going to come crashing down. Can we stand as we pray? Father God, it is so good to be in your word. This series, Lord, we are so grateful to sit this entire summer under your teaching in the Sermon on the Mount. Thank you, Lord, for this first century sermon that still speaks to us in the 21st century and beyond. God, your word speaks. And we want to be not just mere hearers of your word, but together we proclaim that we want to be doers of your word too. God, we are grateful for all that you have done. 
for all that you are doing and for all that you will do in our lives. God, help us to be people who make that urgent decision to have our lives built on the firm foundation of you, Jesus Christ, and on your unchanging truth, the word of God. We give you praise, and we long to be like you. It's in your powerful name, Jesus, we pray, and we say together, amen. As we conclude this sermon series,